So today uh, we, so we have concluded the part, for the moment, the part of first order equations. So we start now with a new kind of equation, which is, by the way, very, very uh, useful in physics in particular. Okay, so uh, what I would like to, to start today is to study the following PDE. So UTT equal some constant, positive constant, uh, Laplace of U. So let me, let me uh, introduce the symbols. So we are, our variables are T and X now, T and X into R1 plus N, which is splitted as uh, follows. So t is a scalar variable, x is a vector. And uh, we will, so uh, if you want to compare with the previous notations, maybe, maybe we use this as, uh, we use this capital N in the sense of one plus n. So t is real, x is a vector. Uh, we will ba be mainly uh, interested in the case n equal one, okay? Yes, uh, we will study mainly. Uh, u is a function uh, and also for the region of interest is maybe Maybe uh, not not the wall space, but uh, but we will often restrict to to this uh, half space. So t maybe will be non-negative, positive times, say, and x will be in R n usually. Even if uh, we could also go back in time, but, uh, but uh, physically maybe it's more meaningful to consider non-negative times. Our pictures will be usually uh, putting x uh, in the horizontal axis and t in the vertical axis, despite the fact that t is the first variable as usual, okay? Remember this strange uh, convention that we, we took. So what does it mean ut? ut for us is du over dt. And therefore, so this is the partial derivative. And therefore, utt is the second uh, derivative. So c is given, is a constant given. And uh, this is called Laplacian. of u and is defined as the sum from one to n d u over d x i. Maybe, maybe these two, we can put it here. So it's uh, the, the trace of the action, okay? It's the sum of the pure second derivatives. Hmm? In one space dimension, our equation is utt equal c square uxx, okay? This is our, our interest. Sometimes this can be written as follows, one over c square utt equal Laplace of u, and uh, or if you wish, uh, d over dt, d over u. So in, sometimes the time variable is substituted by 
this constant c times the time variable. And very often, it happens that uh, um, we take the norm people take the normalization c equal one. Okay. Very often, one normalizes things so that c is equal to one. Normalization. So some, for, for many qualitative results, we, we can take C equal 1. Physically, maybe, uh, sometimes it is better to keep the C, because C will be very large in general. Hmm. OK, so uh, let us start. So this is a linear, but which is the difference. Uh, first of all, which is the difference with respect to the previous equation? Well, this is a second order PD, two derivatives. Okay, so it is a completely different object with respect to first uh, our 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 PD our quasi linear PD that we have studied before. Okay, so this is of course linear but uh, first order, one derivative here, one time derivative, one uh, first order uh, spatial derivative, non-homogeneous. For the moment, this is, on the other hand, uh, second order in time, second order in space, and homogeneous. So if, if, if the operator is written as follows, then this is the, the PD operator, and it is clearly homogeneous because there is no f on the right hand side. Hmm? Uh, don't make the confusion uh, of this equation with another completely different equation, which I can write, for instance, like this. So don't, uh, don't confuse the sign. It is very important here that the sign is minus. Hmm? Otherwise, uh, if the sign would be plus, and if you take, for, if you take for instance, c equal 1, that's, then this is simply the Laplace operator in R1 R plus n. So it's, it's another equation. It's a so-called elliptic equation. So uh, please keep in mind the, the sign. OK, so uh, the first, the first um, arguments that we, we took for the study of first order linear PDs was to define the characteristic, uh, the characteristic surface, because that was the point on the question was, uh, what does it mean uh, given initial condition? And we discovered that uh, we can give an initial condition for this equation provided that, <clears throat> that there is a, a, a transversality, say, between the vector field uh, 1b and the sigma that uh, we are considering, where we want to give the initial condition, the, the, the hyperplane t equal to 0, for instance. Okay. Do you remember this? So uh, if our initial condition was given at time 0, then our vector field b, say, at least in the, in the simplest case, say, in, in the simplest case, when b is constant, for instance, uh, and then b can, should not be tangential to, to, to sigma. Do you remember this? Okay. So now, and that was important for giving, uh, because it's, it's, never, it's never immediate to, uh, to say which are the natural boundary conditions for this PD or that PD. So any PD must be understood with a particular uh, initial condition. So now we want to consider this free equation in the, free, in the space, in time space, but we want to give also a notion of initial condition. So what does it mean initial condition in this case? That is the, the, the first question, OK? And again, we need, as, as before, for these linear problems, uh, we, need, uh, we need the notion of um, characteristic surface. So it is interesting that also here, 
there, there is again the notion of a characteristic uh, surface. So let, let me give you some definitions. So uh, definition. Uh, let me uh, call um, the operator, maybe the operator L. So let, let me call this L of U. So L is an operator taking, in this viewpoint, L take a function in some functional space that now for the moment I don't specify. So takes the function U into L of U, which is this combination of second derivatives, okay? For instance, if U is C2, this is C0, hmm? for instance, okay? So it is a linear operator from, say, for instance, C2 into C0. Hmm? OK. Um, uh, define so, so let me let me use this uh, notation. So a vector, say actually a covector uh, psi into R. 1 plus n. Let me split it into, so this actually would be a covector, but I don't want to insist in the geometrical meaning on this, but, but uh, xi, uh, xi hat, uh, maybe xi prime, who knows xi prime, and so xi is in R, xi prime. So I split xi into the first component and the last components. Xi prime are all the remaining components. And so um, xi zero square equal c square xi square. Hmm? So let me, for simplicity, in this argument, take c equal to 1 just for which is not for the moment important. So let me normalize constants so that C is equal to one. And so let us consider this uh, hypersurface uh, in uh, this space. And this is called, uh, so a, a vector here is called a set of characteristic vectors for the operator L. For L, um, this, sorry, uh, so this is the set of characteristic vectors. So, and I say that, uh, and I say that, uh, let let sigma be a hypersurface into R n plus one hypersurface. So, uh, C one hypersurface so that I can speak about its normal. And I say that uh, uh, x into sigma is characteristic, characteristic if uh, the, so I have maybe already used this notation If the, the normal to the surface, one of the two unit normals, one of the two unit normals uh, to the surface at x uh, is a characteristic vector. Hmm? Uh, I say that it is non-characteristic, non-characteristic. This point here, x, is non-characteristic if new sigma of x does not belong to car L. Um, so for instance, uh, 
let us, for example, so first of all, maybe it is important to, to draw this set here. Can, can you tell me which, which kind of hypersurface is this? Which kind of hypersurface is this? Hi? Hyperbolic? Do you think so? Hyperboloids. Um, uh, let, let us, for instance, consider we are interesting mainly, as I said, n equal to 1. So let us try to understand what does it mean. Oh, sorry. Uh, x1 squared. What is this? Hmm? Exactly. It's not a, hyper, a hyper, uh, high, hyperbola. What is this? Is a cross. OK? This is a cross. But more generally, if we are in three dimensions, what is, what is this now in three dimensions? Uh, this means this is the norm, by the way, the Euclidean norm. So this is simply. And what is this? Is it? And so? And so what is this? No, he says cylinder. No, it's not a cylinder, right? Only half cone? Double cone. It's just the cone. So this is a cone in general. Hmm? Now if you if you if you restore the C here, then you modify the the, the aperture of the cone. Hmm? Depending on C, then uh, the cone uh, change. But let the, if the is if C is equal to one, this is exactly forty five degrees. Okay? In, this, in two dimensions. If you change C, then maybe you can end up with some different cross, like this or like this, depending on C. Depending on C. But for C equal to 1, it's just uh, the, this 45 degree angles. Oh, this is the origin, by the way. OK, this is, this is the origin. This is not the origin. OK. Ah, uh, sigma is the surface sigma is non characteristic, is non characteristic if all x in sigma are non characteristics. Are non characteristic. So examples, exercises, say. So uh, exercise one. Take sigma equal um, This sigma. So you have to imagine this sigma here. Okay. Now, is this sigma uh, characteristic or not? 
Thank you. Uh, take, uh, <laughs> well, then take only half of this, say without the origin, or just a part of it. Just say this half line, or just one line instead. Yeah, c equal 1, just for simplicity. Let, let us take c equal 1 for the moment. Uh, or if you, if you want to restore the character, well, uh, take this without the 0, however. The, remove the origin from the cone, huh? because it's a singular point, and uh, the Observation is that it's not an hypersurface in the classical sense. Okay, remove the origin from the cone. Take the cone without the origin. You see also, also here. So now what we have to do? We have to compute. So this is sigma for the moment. Let us compute the normal to sigma. One of the two normals. Say either this or this. One of the two. Hmm? Okay. How can I compute it? Well, let me introduce, for instance, I, 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 one idea is to look at this as, the, as, a, as a level set, as a level set of a function in one plus n variables, and then take the gradient. So if I if I look at this as the zero level set hmm, of a function with non-vanishing gradient, at least out of the origin then the gradient will be normal to the surface, right? Because the gradient is orthogonal to the level sets. Hmm? So let me obviously introduce, uh, sorry, this is, this is Xi prime. Uh, so the, the, uh, sorry, uh, my notation was uh, to consider the, this, the spatial part of Xi, the Xi prime. So this is psi prime here, this is psi prime, and so two psi primes. Okay. okay, so now this is um, one half psi square minus psi prime square. Huh? It is clear that now sigma is the zero level set of this. So the level set of sigma, of sigma are, are um, how, how are the, 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 the level set of sigma, by the way? Can you imagine? Huh? So this is the zero level set. Ah, yes. Now yes. OK. When I, but doesn't matter. We, we are interested just only in the zero level set. And so we know that now let, let us take the gradient of psi in the wall space. This is differentiable, of course. Let us take the gradient of psi everywhere. So psi is defined everywhere. This is the, the domain of psi. But psi vanishes here on the cone. Hmm? But it is defined everywhere, also outside the cone, everywhere. Now, uh, this is um, psi 0 minus psi prime, right? Now, this, of course, is 0 in the origin, at the origin. But out of the origin is not 0. So out of the origin, this vector is orthogonal to the cone. Is it clear? Is this clear? Huh? The cone is a, is a level set. The gradient is non zero. The gradient is orthogonal to the, to the level set. OK? Fine. Now, uh, but the gradient, uh, now take a point where, um, so for instance, in two dimensions, take this point here. This is sigma. And now what happens to the gradient at this? So this is psi 1, psi prime. This is psi naught. 
and now take the gradient of uh, uh, psi at this point, which means simply taking the gradient and restrict it at this point, yeah. evaluate it at this point. And where is it now? Now I, I change the, the, the sign of psi, psi prime. So I take this psi prime and the same psi zero. Psi zero, and this is uh, again uh, so. This is the normal, hmm? which is here with our with our uh, choice. This is the first example. Um, now take. Another example is what we will always take will be t equal to 0. Sigma is t equal to 0. And t equal to 0 is, again, this, as usual. The normal is this. And in this case, the normal does not belong to the cone. This, this, is more, this is more lucky. This surface now is such that the normal does not belong to the cone. In the previous case, the normal was belonging to the cone. Huh? As you see here, the normal was belonging to the cone. But now the normal does not belong to the cone. Hmm? So this is OK. It's non-characteristic. The horizontal line is non-characteristic. The cone, on the other hand, is a problem because you see, take the normal here, then the normal belongs to the cone. So it's, char it's characteristic. This is not. It's non-characteristic. Uh, is non-characteristic, and the normal is, of course, new sigma at x is uh, 1, 0, 0, which does not belong to the, uh, to the cone. So this suggests that maybe it is, it is reasonable to take a sigma as a surface where studying the, the, the Cauchy problems hmm? we're assigning initial conditions okay so we will never assign initial conditions on surface sigma like this because the normal to this belongs to, to the cone <laughs> huh? um, but we will assign, we will assign uh, initial condition on sigma like this. Okay. So uh, let me uh, let me summarize. This uh, set here, sigma equal t square equal to x square, is characteristic. Uh, so let, let us forget the origin for the moment, which is not, not so important, but sigma t equal to 0 is non-characteristic. OK. So So we will, we will consider a sort of having the experience of first order equation, we will consider ut t equals, say, c squared Laplace of u in, uh, uh, as I said, uh, um, 
One could also work uh, for backward in time, but let us consider for the moment just for simplicity this, and then u0 equal u, uh, say, 0 bar, u bar, uh, u0 bar, maybe, at t equal 0 on sigma, on sigma. Now, uh, the point is that uh, uh, one in this kind of uh, uh, PD, one has to assign also on sigma not only the initial position, the initial condition, but also the initial velocity. This is because the PD has the following structure, UTT equal something like this, because here there are two times derivatives. Two times derivatives, uh, uh, as we will see, uh, requires a natural way to, to impose initial conditions, like for ODEs in some sense. If you have a second order ODE, you specify initial position and initial velocity, usually. Now you have not, this is not an ODE, this is a PD, but it has two derivatives in time, and therefore it seems reasonable to specify not only the initial function at time zero, but also its time derivative at time zero. So sigma now is non-characteristic, and, and I will assign u bar zero and u bar one. These are given, smooth enough. Okay, so now the point is to, to try to solve this, okay? Okay, uh, but before doing this, I want to mention just uh, one big theorem. Theorem. And for instance, you can look at the proof, for instance, in the book of Evans. Uh, and it is called Cauchy. Cauchy-Kovaleskaya. The theorem is called Cauchy-Kovaleskaya. And it says the following. Assume sigma non-characteristic. Actually, actually, one could give this in a local version, but for simplicity, I don't want to state it locally around the point. I state it globally just, just for simplicity. So assume that sigma is non-characteristic and analytic. Analytic. Assume. Assume u0 bar, u1 bar, analytic real analytic. This means that around each point, these functions and, uh, well, these functions uh, uh, coincide with their Taylor expansion, with their Taylor series around each point. And this means that uh, you can look at this, uh, for instance, in a parametric way or as a graph locally of an analytic function, hmm? as usual. So everything is analytic. And assume that you want to consider, consider UTT equal f of t x ut grad u, say, Hessian of u. Say space uh, space uh, Ashan, for instance, all second derivatives with respect to space. Mm -hmm. So the important is that here on the right hand side you don't have a second time derivative here, and you, and you don't have derivatives of u of the order higher than two. Okay. For instance, in one space dimension, f t x, u, t, u, x, u, x, x, hmm? for instance. 
So on the right hand side, no third derivatives, not second derivative with respect to time. Just. Uh, uh, ah, yes. In, and u, uh, uh, u equal u0 bar and ut equal. Um, say, for instance, say take this t equal to 0, for instance, ut equal u, u1 bar on sigma. So if all everything is analytic, and f also is analytic, assume you consider uh, f analytic in its arguments, its arguments, huh? UTT equal this. Then say so take, take this for simplicity. Hmm? Then this problem one has a local in time solution, has a unique one, has a unique. Uh, analytic solution u solution u for short times hmm. okay what does it mean it means that okay sigma is clearly analytic in this case because it is a hyperplane hmm. if I give you this problem with initial condition which is analytic and initial velocity which is analytic. And this is clear, this f is analytic in its argument. So then this has a local in time solution, unique which is analytic. I don't prove this theorem here, it's, it's not easy, it's long, but just to let you know that at least for an, for an where, when everything is analytic and sigma is non-characteristic that we have a local solution. One, one can give this statement around the point of sigma without assuming this, but taking just sigma and a non-characteristic, and so locally you have a unique solution. But I don't want to insist on this because I, I, I don't prove it. Just, just to let you know once that there exists this theorem, which is actually much more general than this. It is actually, it holds for a very large class of PDs, not only for uh, kind of uh, wave, I'm uh, sorry, this is called the wave equation, by the way, wave equation. Uh, this is called the wave equation. And this is a typical example of hy hyperbolic second order PDs. Hyperbolic second order linear. Okay, so this theorem I was saying, this theorem is valid not only for hyperbolic type PDs, but is much more general than this. But you need analyticity of everything. Initial conditions, uh, sigma, f, and so on. If you don't have analyticity, then you cannot use this theorem. So this is just to let you know that, uh, okay, even for PDs, in a large class of PDs, if everything is locally analytic, then you have a local solution analytic. Then you can expand in series, in Taylor series. It's, it's not an easy theorem, and if you want, if you are interested just for curiosity, then, for instance, you can look at the book of Evans. Okay. So, um, hmm? yes? Yes. Ah. Thank you. What does it mean, existence for short, for short times? Oh, it means that uh, uh, it means that the PDE is satisfied 
for instance, in 0 t times Rn, say, for some t, but not in, in principle for all t's, just in a strip. Ah, yes, but times is here. All are yes. OK. So uh, to study this PD is not, uh, it is better to, to start <coughs> the first one dimensional space case. <coughs> so we start with n equal 1. N equal 1 means this, OK? N equal 1 means this problem here. Hmm? So now, for the moment, uh, consider just, just the, the PD without conditions. <coughs> and there is the, 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 the very interesting structure of this PD is the following. In, in one space dimension, we have that this can, can be split into the uh, composition of two operators. Okay, and so uh, composition of so let me introduce v maybe um, v <coughs> let me follow this notation v v of t x <coughs> equal d u over d t minus c the u over the x. So let me introduce this. And let us observe that <coughs> dv over dt plus c dv over dx is equal to 0. Hmm? So remark. Con uh, assume that you have a solution. Okay? Assume that you have a solution, u. Define v as follows. Then V satisfies this. Let us check this. Huh? Uh, D over DT. Indeed, D over DT. Hmm? UT minus CUX T plus <coughs> C. UT minus CUX uh, plus C. So this is this. And so what happens? You see UTT. This is UTT minus CUX, UXT plus CUTX. Well, we are talking about C2 solutions. Huh? So the problem is also. Uh, let, let me let me write also the, the regularity class. So um, we look for a solution which is u, say in C two uh, zero plus infinity times r. So that everything is smooth enough. Assume that u0 is maybe c1 or c2 also. Assume that this is c1. Let us take this. OK. So uh, let me go back here. So utt minus c uxt plus c utx minus c squared <coughs> uxx, since by assumption u is a solution and this c2, utx and uxt are equal. And so <coughs> this is equal to uh, this. So this means that uh, uh, this operator, L of u, actually splits into the composition composition of two operators. 
So L of u splits into, first you do, say, this, and then you do this. So it is the composition of two operators. Hmm? So L of u is, say, d over dt <coughs> plus c d over dx of d over dt minus c d over dx of u. Is it, uh, this is a, a, lot, a little bit formal, but it is clear what it means. Huh? So first I do ut minus c u x here. First, first thing to do, for instance. And then to what I obtain that I have called v. Yes, this is v. And then to v, I apply this other first linear first order operator. You see? V. So splitting property, this is an extremely important fact. So splitting property, so the operator L, remark, it's interesting to observe that L splits into the composition of two linear <coughs> first order PDs, uh, operators, or first order operators, first order operators, but of which kind of operator? You see? This is linear transport operator with constant vector field. And this is, again, another linear transport operator, first order, with the, with the, 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 the minus c is now replaced by plus c. So first you apply a step in which you do a linear first order with minus c. And then to the result, you apply, again, linear first order to, with plus c. And this is very, 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 very nice property of this uh, second order of <coughs> operator. And it is in one space dimension, this is the, um, the, the, the trick that allows to find the solution. Now we will see how. OK? So, so let me keep, the, in, the, in the blackboard, let me keep uh, this and uh, this also. Uh, okay, this is not necessary anymore. Uh, okay. We can start from studying this. And what do we know about this? We know the solution, right? So which is, so start, we start with this. Now we start with this. And so now we know that V of Tx, it is equal to what? Maybe, maybe we, we could write, say, v at time 0, huh? right? Just to be precise. And then we chart the, now, what is, what? Now? Exactly, x minus ct. Do we agree? So uh, le le let us call maybe uh, the notation maybe a, a of x, let us define it as v of 0x. Eh? Define this just for, simplicity, for sim 
to simplify notation. So this is actually simply a of x minus ct. Of course, uh, this a is not neither is neither u0 bar nor u1 bar. You see? This is not. Because at, at the end, what is this? Uh, so I, I have to put, say, uh, v, uh, time zero here. And so here you see there is one u1 bar minus c something. Okay? Hmm? So for the moment, uh, let us just simply define this. So let, let me write it just not to forget in the notation. So a of x is defined as v of 0x. And so v of tx is this. OK. Now, so we have solved this for v. And therefore, now what our problem is, however, this, which becomes ut minus cux equal a of x minus ct, right? And what is this now? This is linear transport equation with constant coefficient, but however is non-homogeneous. So we need the solution. We have studied this with constant coefficients, but maybe it is better to, if, if, we, if we, we are able to remember it. Um, maybe we should write it here. If, if I'm not wrong, so if I take ut plus b ux, say, v dot grad u equal f of tx and u of 0, call it uh, u and phi, then the solution was phi of x minus bt plus the integral from 0 to t. And then we have now f of tau let, let please check this. The tau. Check please this uh, this formula. Is it correct? Okay. Fine. Please check it because otherwise, if it is not correct for some for some problems in the sign, then then. We don't go uh, arrive at the end <laughs> of the reasoning. So, uh, so this is linear transport with constant coefficients but non-homogeneous. Okay, is it correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Um, now, therefore, uh, now we can apply this to our problem. Huh? Our problem is uh, this, exactly. And I simply have to change letters, symbols, and to keep a little bit, uh, pay attention not to make mistakes. So uh, this means that uh, we know that the solution u of tx has the following expression. Hmm? Is the initial condition. Huh? Now b is, of course, minus c. OK, b here is, so when, when he, there is b here, I have to put it minus c. Hmm? Look, b minus c. So uh, change b into minus c in this formula. Take one dimension, base. And then, and then um, so phi is the initial condition. So now fi finally, phi is actually u0 bar, right? OK. So, so u0 bar, uh, now I have to, to take uh, uh, this. 
-hmm. And then I have plus the integral from 0 to t. Then in place of f, I have, so let me write from here. I don't want to, I, I try not to make mistakes. So f of uh, tau x plus b tau minus t is, in our case, is equal to what? Is equal to a of x plus b tau minus t. But b actually is uh, minus c. Hmm? So this is uh, the new x. Say is the new x is, uh, and then minus c t. Hmm? This is our x. If I'm not wrong. So let, let me check it. So our f is this, depending only on, uh, on x, on the space variable. So f of tau, this is the object. OK. A. So f of tx is equal f of tx is equal to a of x minus ct. And therefore, f of tx is this plus this minus this. Where? Where? Ah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Minus c tau. Thank you. It's OK. OK. Let me check it if it is correct. Uh, minus c tau, yes, it's, it's, this is, thank you. So now this is equal to a, and then I have x minus uh, 2 c tau uh, plus c t. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our solution is uh, um, a of x minus 2 c tau plus c t in the tau. Huh? Fine. Now, let me change variable here. So let, let, me, let me now make a change of variable. Uh, and so uh, x minus 2 c tau plus c t, I call it for the moment, uh, say, y. OK, I call it y. And therefore, uh, utx, now this, this integral, the integral from 0 to t of a x minus 2 c tau plus c t d tau becomes a of y. Then d tau is minus 1 over 2c. So and then 1 uh, d y. And then one, uh, when um, tau is equal to 0, this is, this is huh? This is x plus ct. And then when tau is equal to t, this is x minus ct. And therefore, actually, my solution u reads as follows. Now I raise this part. OK. Um, so I end up with u of tx equal to u0 bar of x plus c t uh, plus, because now I change, uh, I 
in, I there is a minus here, so I change the, the integral. So um, 1 over 2c x minus ct x plus ct a of y dy. OK? So what remains now? Now it remains exactly. It remains to express A in, in terms of U0 and U1. And therefore, what we know about A, so we know that A, A actually is what? Is U bar 1 uh, minus C U0 X bar. Hmm? Because you see, we have u u is equal u zero bar on sigma. Huh? So on sigma, they agree. By smoothness, u actually is smooth up to sigma. So. The derivatives of u in this direction, the derivative of u in this direction is equal to the derivative of u0 bar in the same direction. So our solution actually is smooth. OK. And so A is this. Do you agree? By smoothness, u is C1 up to T equal to 0. OK. Then we, we can, therefore, almost, we are almost at the end, so so utx actually is equal to what? To u0 bar of x plus ct plus 1 over 2c, the integral plus ct. And then I have u1 prime bar y dy. And this I keep alone. And then 1 over 2c, and then I have uh, x minus ct, x plus ct, um, by the way, now we have uh, my, this, there is this minus c, actually. OK. So I, I erase this. And then apparently there is also a minus. And then I have u0 x bar y dy. And I end up with what? With um, 1 half u0 bar x plus ct, because this one half cancels one half of this hmm? plus uh, one half uh, u zero bar x minus c t. Okay, plus one over two c integral from x minus c t. This is a very very interesting formula dy. OK, let me check it. That Let me check that I have. Uh, uh, it's correct, surely correct, but uh, yes, it is correct. So, so we have found the following. We have proven the following theorem. 
So we have proven the following theorem that it is called, no, well, this formula is called the D'Alembert formula. D'Alembert formula. Uh, maybe D'Alembert. D'Alembert? D'Alembert. Okay, the theorem that we have proven is the following. Theorem. So let, say, u zero bar in C2, u one bar in C1 of sigma, Uh, define u of tx as one half u zero bar of x plus ct plus u zero bar of x minus ct plus one over two c x minus ct x plus ct u bar 1 y dy, then then u is c2 times r. You see c2 because, because u0 bar is c2 by assumption. Hmm? U1 is, U bar 1 is C1, so its integral actually is C2. And that's important because, because we want to, to solve a second order PD. So UTT, UXX, we need C2. Hmm? Is a solution to, is a solution to our PD. And say the limit as tx goes to 0x of utx is equal to u bar 0x. Limit as tx goes to 0x, uttx equal u bar 1 of x. And this is called the D'Alembert formula. It's remarkable to have such, to have such, such, such an explicit expression of the solution. Hmm? Rather remarkable. Remember, it is essential. We have used in an essential way the one space dimension. The problem of, uh, of having such a kind of formulas in two, three, four dimensions is, is, another, is another story. But in one space dimension, at least, we have this, uh, this OK? Yes, it is unique. It is possible to prove that it is unique. Uh, Yes. Hmm? Indeed, you can prove the following. So the question was, the question was, is, is this solution unique? Huh? For, um, remark. Uh, so it, it, you see. Um, what we have done up to now in this course is to look for more or less explicit formula, more or less explicit, maybe in some, sometimes implicit 
formula for, represent, for representing solutions. This is not, not possible in general for any PD, but these are linear PDs, and therefore it's very interesting to start with special solution, with, with the explicit solution, so that you can understand the qualitative properties. It's extremely important. Then, if you have a more difficult problem, for instance, assume that you want to solve uh, uh, this PD but with strange boundary conditions, or instead uh, of the wall half space just only in a piece, then maybe you don't have an explicit solution like this. Uh, and so you cannot hope to have uh, such a kind of formula. But at least you know that in this uh, uh, ex uh, special, uh, simple cases, uh, you, can, you can understand a lot of things from this. And then you can hope that in more general cases, maybe qualitatively, there are the same properties, maybe. It's, very, it's, always, it's always important to have uh, the, the largest possible number of explicit solutions at hand. This is, this is very important. Hmm? Uh, the remark uh, concerning your question, then, then maybe this is some work, it's not so difficult. I think that assume u in C2 is a solution to utt minus c squared uxx equal to 0 then necessarily in, uh, say, 0 plus infinity times r, then necessarily there exists two real functions, f, g uh, of class C2 from r to r of class C2, such that u of tx is equal to f once you know this once you know this this is not difficult by the way why it is so because the operator splits into the composition of two operators of the form x minus ct and x plus ct. Huh? So this is homework. It's not easy. At it's, not, it's not difficult at all. This is very easy. But once you know this, then it turns out that necessarily f must be this. If you, now, if you add initial conditions, well, now add your. In, so this is in general without, without, without conditions on the boundary, right? This is this is in general on the in the half space. Hmm? So in the half space, a C two solution must be the superposition of something traveling on the left, C is positive, and something traveling on the right. Hmm? Now I, I will be more precise on this. Superposition of these two objects. Once you know this, if you want to solve uh, your PD with u0 equal u0 bar at time 0, derivative at time 0 equal u1 bar, then necessarily you end up with this. OK? This is uniqueness. This is uniqueness. Imposing boundary conditions, uh, initial conditions, mm -hmm. initial conditions implies that U is S. So, so now let us try to 
Now let us try to 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 make some exercises on this expression. So I keep maybe I keep okay. So you see, <clears throat> this is of the form. This is of course of the form f of x plus c t plus g of x minus c t. Huh? It's not the. I think f and g are equal. There. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. S x will take one over u zero x plus c g. So let me. Uh, so you claim that f and g are equal? No, I don't think so. Yes. Oh, because you think so? So let, let, who, who is f now? F is equal to uh, f of y is equal to one over two. Yes. U zero y. U zero bar y. y. Yes. Plus one over two c. Yes. Integral from x to y. From x to y. Uh, x to so x now no I, I, uh, maybe x you have to just fix some point yes. zero y zero. zero. Why? Uh, zero. I mean, you have to just to fix uh, because this depends on, on y only, no? Ah, yes. Okay. Zero y, say. Okay. Uh, you are one of s in the s. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is uh, this is f and g is the same. You you claim. Maybe you are right. Let's see. So if I take now uh, f of x plus ct plus g of x minus ct, what do I find? I find this is correct, of course, and then 1 over 2c equals 0 y, sorry, 1x plus ct plus integral 0x minus ct. Uh, but then there is a minus here. Uh, minus uh, x minus c t zero u bar one u bar one uh, and so I have just uh, the, the problem of the sign here right there should be plus. Let me take. Let me check one. So this is this is the part concerning. Um, this is this, from zero to this. And then if I take g oh, plus one to c, zero x minus c t u bar one y. You, it is this right? If I just sum them. Okay. So it seems to me that uh, well, uh, it is uh, the, the idea is okay. You have to, to in order to construct f and g, you take g, this. This is okay, and then I take a primitive of u one bar exactly. You so that the, it's. So having only f uh, would 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 would. would it is already interesting to take uh, initial velocity equal to zero. Hmm? It is uh, already very interesting to start the problem, to start the problem uh, with, with initial velocity equal to zero, which 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 is only f, as you as you said essentially. Okay. So now, so let, let us just argue. Let, let us just. So uh, for the moment, let, let us just try to understand the proper qualitative properties of our wave, knowing only that it has this, this particular structure. See. Huh? So um, the exercise, so let, let me. Let me. Uh, write down 
the following exercise. So this is z equal uh, g, g of x, z equal g of x. z equal f of x, for instance. And then okay, CT so C is positive. So if this is the graph of capital G, say huh? and therefore Uh, this is the graph of g of x minus ct. Hmm? G is the graph of, this is the graph of g of x minus ct, moving in this direction on the right, with velocity ct. So this is a sort of wave. You can think of this. So you have the, 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 the form of the graph of g. This is given. And then your solution, this, the, the part of your solution is something which travels on the right with constant velocity on the right, given by C, keeping the same shape. So it translates on the right like this. This is, on the other hand, something which translates on the left with keeping the, the same form of f, graph of f. This is the graph of f. Hmm? So it is the superposition. Our, our solution is the superposition of two objects traveling. I, I, for instance, if the initial speed is zero, which is more easy to understand, uh, if the initial speed is zero, then this is not present anymore. And we can think about f to be the initial condition, u0 bar, essentially. Essentially. And so you have u0 bar here and u0 bar here. Just only the superposition of u0 uh, bar of x plus ct and u0 bar of x minus ct. Huh? It is, uh, to understand this, the, the D'Alembert formula, for me, it's, it's, for the, it's interesting to analyze the case u1 bar equal to 0. Hmm? So that these are, as, as he said, they are equal to u0 bar, half, one or one half. Huh? Okay. Um, so I, I leave you some homework for now. The next week I will not uh, be here, so we will we will continue. So you have a lot of time. So. Maybe it is better to give you some exercise. So, homework. Um, one, u of t naught x naught depends 
on the values of u0 bar, u1 bar only in x0 minus ct0, x0 plus ct0. Hence, it, depend, it does not depend, depend on the global the, the global properties you have to to think about this this says this is very easy to see from your solution it says that uh, your solution does not really depend on the global shape of the initial conditions but at, at the, the solution here does not depend on the, how u bar 0 and u bar u1 bar are very very far but just only on an interval which is this So uh, the, the, U, the value of U is insensitive of modification of the initial conditions out of this. If you change the initial conditions out of this, you don't see it at the level of the value of U at that point. Yes, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it is very easy, but it is, it, it's, it's immediate. No, no, uh, I would like to ask Think about this, uh, write down the interval. If you have, uh, if you have uh, here, say, t naught x naught, t naught x naught, write down here where is it the interval. And you have to meditate on this because this is, uh, is an essential property of wave equations. It's immediate, I agree. Second immediate exercise. <laughs> it's very easy. So uh, fix. Uh, an interval of the form x minus a less than or equal than r on x-axis. Fix this interval. Uh, draw the set, the set of tx such that u of tx depends only on the values of u0 bar, u1 bar on the interval. Hmm? So here you have I'm sorry, this is a home, homework. Um, so, third, third homework. Um, and draw and, and, and prove that this is equal to Prove that this is equal to x minus a less than or equal to r minus ct. ct. Maybe we can go also backward in time. More interesting exercise is the following. Take uh, u, so assume, assume u1 bar equal to 0. Hmm? Take u0 bar of the following form uh, x plus alpha if minus alpha is less than or equal 
uh, min, um, minus x plus alpha if 0 less than or equal than x less than or equal than alpha and 0 else. OK. Um, depict, draw, say depict the graph of u t x at times u t dot, say, at times t equal to alpha over 4c, alpha over 2c, 3 alpha over 4c, uh, alpha over c, 5 alpha over c, uh, and larger. And uh, Now, oh, by the way, uh, maybe a remark. This initial condition is not C2, as you see. It's just Lipschitz. OK? So this creates a little bit of problem, because, uh, because our formulas, for the moment, work only for u bar 0 in C2. This, this, is, this has corners in the graph. It is corners. By the way, um, uh, the D'Alembert formula is OK also in this Lipschitz case. So the, the, the exercise number three says, take the D'Alembert formula as it is also in this Lipschitz case and draw the solution for these times. Hmm? And then, um, suppose, suppose, so this is alpha 1, this is alpha 2. This is the characteristic lines. These, these are called, the characteristic lines are this x minus ct equal to constant. Uh, draw the characteristic lines. Suppose suppose uh, u bar 0, in this case, eh? again, call uh, equal 0 in, in alpha 1, alpha 2. Then divide this into six regions, time space into six regions, 5, 1, 3, 4, this is time space. Here, the initial condition is 0 in, uh, in this, in, in the complement of this. Otherwise, it is trivial. So in the complement of this. So um, here, you have superposition of two waves. L try to, to, to look at that, that number three exercise to interpret the number three exercise into the time space uh, <clears throat> graph here. Here you uh, try to realize that here you have a superposition, superposition of two waves, one going to the right, the other going to the left. Here in region 2, here, here it is 0. Here you prove, try to prove that the solution is in region 6 is 0. Try to prove that the solution in, in region 5 is 0. Try to prove that the solution in region 4 is 0. Here there is superposition of two waves. 
And here there is just one wave, and here there is just one other wave, another wave. So, um, so here there is just direct wave, so-called direct wave. Just that that one traveling to the right, and the other is called the inverse wave. So if you look in time space, there are these six regions where here you have superposition of a direct and inverse wave. They sum up together. Here you see just in on region two, you see just only one way one wave. Here you see the other wave only, and the other. In the other three regions, the solution is compact, is uh, zero, zero. So this is, this is interesting, this is exercise, because the first part, you need to understand the, the, the shape of the solution. Given a time, then you, you, you depict the graph. For that time, the graph in space, a fixed time. But it is, this is a uh, more, more is another viewpoint. So the previous one is just a time slice of this. So if you cut this at time, say, alpha over 2c, you draw a horizontal line at that time, then the graph you're looking for there is just what you see from here at, the, at this time. But this is in time space, so it's more complicated. It's more global. So in this case, also, this u1 is 0? Yes, u1 bar is 0. This is still exercise three. This is, this is a continuation of exercise three. And u bar, u bar one is zero. Yes. Okay. <laughs>